So seagrasses are unique marine plants. And unlike seaweeds and algae, they are true angiosperms. They're true plants that are closely related to water lilies. And seagrasses are the only rooted plant that exist in our oceans. So just like flowering plants on land, seagrass have flowers, fruits and seeds, but without insects and the wind, pollination and the movement of seeds is helped by marine animals and water currents. Small crustaceans, for example, those known as amphipods have been described as the bees of the sea because they pollinate seagrass flowers just like bees do for land plants. And grazers like dugongs, turtles and birds eat seagrass shoots containing seeds, travel with them in their stomachs to new areas and then release them in their feces to help facilitate um, genetic diversity across new meadows. Now, seagrasses evolved around 65 to 100 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. And since then have evolved on three separate occasions to um, deliver the species that exist today. When they returned to the sea, they were likely grazed on by herbivorous crocodiles that went extinct during the Cretaceous mass extinction event or large marine sloths like those pictured here. But over the millions of years that followed, seagrasses evolved and adapted to a life under water. Such adaptations are having specialized osmo osmoregulatory cells that can tolerate salt water. And seagrasses, unlike other plants, are not nutrient limited. So they instead get most of their energy from the sun. And they're extremely efficient at this and even um, can even exist. Um, in really low light conditions, even up to depths of over 100 meters. And seagrasses have really strong roots and rhizomes that anchor the plant in place. And it, in fact, over 50% of the plant's biomass is actually below the sediment, below the sand. And finally, seagrasses evolved to have specialized waterproof pollen to help it reproduce in salt water. So moving on to more recent history reveals where our connection to seagrass in Western society began. The same properties that allowed it to flourish in our seas made it a useful resource in building. Once dry, seagrass leaves are relatively moisture proof. So this made them a brilliant material to be used in building insulation. And in the late 1800s, Samuel Cabot created a thriving seagrass empire revolving around the Cabot quilt. And this product used, used a vast amounts of seagrass that were collected across North America in places like New England and Nova Scotia. And then these quilts were used to insulate buildings across the United States, including Radio City Music Hall, the Rockefeller Center in New York, as well as the Capitol building in Washington, DC. And similar products were also used to insulate the Bank of London, the Bank of England in London. And this material was also used to insulate the hut of Captain Robert Falcon Scott, built as headquarters for the ill-fated Terra Nova expedition. And this hut still stands to this day. And in 1919, the world's first ref commercial refrigerator, developed by the Frigidaire Company, had liner panels that were built using seagrass. And these properties of, of seagrass, uh, as well as its ability to be washed, made seagrass a useful material to fill mattresses as well. 
And such mattresses were used in residential schools and hospitals and psychiatric institutions. And in such institutions, the material inside these mattresses was often used to focus therapy, to create handicrafts by patients, like this seagrass hat and woman's stockings. But it was also used from time to time as a form of inspiration. Pictured here, a patient inspired by pictures of Polynesian clothing, wearing a seagrass sash and skirt. And you can also note that seagrass lines the floor to his room. So seagrasses were once this abundant resource used across Western society. But even as Cabot's quilt and seagrass was reaching the peak of its popularity, larger forces were already in motion. In the 1920s, a plant disease, then identified simply as eelgrass blight, but now known to be caused by a marine slime mold, began wiping out seagrass meadows. This loss even made it to the New York Times. And by the mid 1930s, the, the seagrass was virtually extinct across most of the Northern Hemisphere. And the Cabot's quilt soon followed into oblivion. So following the war, our, our use of the plant in Western society and our connection to seagrass was all but forgotten. So out of sight, out of mind in the decades that followed, seagrass meadows continued to be lost on a global scale. For example, the fastest declines were observed in the North Pacific with a 1000 fold loss of meadow area from the 1950s to the 1970s and where they, they still have not recovered. And despite some recovery in the North Atlantic, seagrass area in this region is still 40 to 70% smaller in size than when our records began. So it's a pretty bleak picture for seagrass meadows across the world with often similar or even worse rates of decline than coral reefs and rainforests. And in the UK, seagrass was once much more widespread than it is today. This figure documents 1930s estimates of places known to have had seagrass meadows, many of which no longer exist today. And conservative estimates suggest that around 44% of the UK's seagrass area has been lost since 1936, with, with less conservative estimates placing that figure at over 90%. And it's only until relatively recently then that we've really began to understand what this means and why seagrasses are important at the global level. We now know that seagrass meadows are vital for biodiversity, for people and for the planet. Seagrass ecosystems provide a wide variety of benefits or ecosystem services that support human well-being around the world, things like support for biodiversity. So seagrass meadows are hotspots of this marine biodiversity, including protected and charismatic species like rays, seahorses, dugongs and turtles, as well as multiple other species of fish and invertebrates. And there can often be more than 40% more fish in seagrass than adjacent sandy areas. And thousands of fish are known to be seagrass associated or dependent on the habitat entirely. 
And as a result of this, seagrass meadows support fisheries and they support, they provide nursery habitats for fish, bivalve and crustacean species that we target commercially. So providing livelihoods and food security for millions of people across the world. In fact, seagrass meadows provide valuable nursery habitat to over one fifth of the world's 25 largest fisheries. And these include the walleye pollock, the most landed species on the planet, as well as Atlantic and Pacific cod and herring, one of Britain's favorites. And in the Mediterranean, seagrass covers just 2% of the seafloor, but seagrass associated fish and invertebrates are responsible for up to 40% of the total value of commercial fisheries landings. So if you've been to the Mediterranean on holiday and eaten fish, it's highly likely that seagrass may have supported the food on your plate. But we, we often fail in our perception that some of these, these, um, these fisheries are offshore resources. Take Atlantic cod, for example. And there's a, a real limited appreciation of the crucial role that seagrass meadows play in stocking these offshore resources. So like, ignoring seagrass here, it, it's like ignoring that apples grow on trees and assuming then that they just appear on supermarket shelves. Fish and the people that depend on them need seagrass. And there are numerous other benefits seagrasses provide. Seagrasses are natural filters that absorb excessive nutrients out of the water column and store them in their rich sediments. So a recent study from Sweden showed that historic losses of seagrass from 1980 onwards, 1980 onwards likely cost local authorities up to $140 million in nutrient absorption costs alone. And that's just for one seagrass meadow on the Swedish west coast. So losing seagrass isn't just negative for the environment. It's, it affects societal investment away from things like schools and infrastructure towards measures that have to be put in place to control environmental nutrient pollution. But of course, healthy and resilient seagrass meadows can do that job. So healthy and, sea, healthy and resilient seagrasses can free up more money to help sustainable economic development. Now, seagrasses also put, support human health and tourism. You know how houseplants are touted to keep the, the air in our homes clean and free from pollutants? Well. Seagrasses basically do that underwater. Seagrasses have this unique ability to control human, fish, and coral diseases by absorbing and removing harmful bacterial pathogens from the water column. In fact, in the tropics, places with seagrass have up to 50% less harmful pathogens than sites without seagrass. And the same goes for seagrass meadows that exist in our temperate oceans, like those around the UK. Places with seagrass have up to 60% less harmful bacteria, such as Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of cholera. So this makes them great places to swim, but also useful to keep our waterways healthy. And finally, seagrass meadows store large amounts of carbon, helping to mitigate climate change. Unlike trees, which store carbon within their trunks, seagrasses export carbon deep into the sediments below them, trapping it and locking it away for centuries by preventing resuspension. 
And because seagrass meadows can be thousands of years old, some of the carbon stocks that exist beneath them are ancient. In fact, one of the oldest known seagrass meadows in the world is, is up to 200,000 years old and is likely sitting on carbon stores of likely similar age. However, if these ecosystems are degraded or lost entirely, their carbon sink capacity is adversely affected. And the carbon that's stored within their sediments is released back into the atmosphere, resulting in CO2 emissions that actually contribute to climate change. So degraded seagrass meadows actually become net carbon emitters. So this is why protecting seagrass is so vital. For example, a heat wave in 2012 on the, the west coast of Australia caused a massive loss of seagrass through heat stress. And as a result, potentially up to 9 million tons of carbon were released back into the atmosphere. And to put that number in perspective, that's the equivalent to the yearly emissions of over 3 million households in the UK. And again, this is just for one site in Western Australia. Just imagine what that picture light looks like for the, for the whole world. Just imagine the amount of carbon emissions losing that seagrass that we had was caused. It's a really, really big problem. But when they're protected and when they're well-functioning, seagrasses really are superheroes, and even more so when you place them in the context of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In the biosphere, seagrass meadows support biodiversity, providing life below water. But they also provide clean water and sanitation, as well as helping us to mitigate climate change. Across society, seagrass meadows are a source of livelihood and food security for many of those in poverty. And fish caught in seagrass can be a vital source of nutrition for millions. But they also reduce harmful bacteria, environments that we use for recreation. And then moving up to the economy, they provide nature based solutions, nature based infrastructure to help tackle issues such as nutrient pollution and climate change. But despite these now recognized benefits of seagrass, particularly within the scientific community, loss continues on a global scale. And many meadows across the world are in a truly dire state. And this is true for meadows in the UK. While this loss is well documented in some locations like this recent survey from Tampa Bay, Florida, released just a couple of weeks ago, loss and degradation goes unnoticed and undocumented in many areas of the world. It's happening right beneath our noses and we're not doing anything about it. And herein lie the six global challenges for seagrass conservation. The six global challenges that we need to meet to, to facilitate a sustainable future for seagrass meadows. The first uh, and probably greatest of these challenges is achieving societal recognition of seagrass importance. So that's Bold management and restoration decisions can be met with public support. Now, despite seagrass being a global resource, many people have never heard of it, or they confuse it with things like seaweed and algae. I bet that if you were to go to your local high street and ask people what seagrass is, I bet good money on the majority having no idea what it is or 
thinking that it's a basket or a rug from Ikea. So when people are removed from that um, direct experience or when the ecosystem service provided is indirect, like the value of seagrass as a nursery ground for supporting the major fisheries I just discussed, recognition of what seagrass is and why it is important is really, really poor. However, where, where fishers depend on seagrass for livelihoods and, and food, like in many low income and emerging economies across the tropics, the recognition of seagrass and its value to these things is, is high. And that gives us a little bit of hope. It gives us something to work with. And this limited societal recognition of seagrass is made worse by its apparent image problem, especially in comparison to uh, other highly charismatic uh, habitats like coral reefs, which are colorful, vibrant ecosystems. And many people have a sense of fear or, or yeah, a sense of fear of swimming or snorkeling in seagrass meadows. And Trippers, TripAdvisor is adorned with, you know, it's full of, full of negative reviews of beaches and hotel resorts with seagrass meadows, with many reviews asking people to rip it up. So it's a really sad state, state of affairs. So the real challenge here is making sure that the general public, uh, politicians and decision makers are better informed about how seagrass meadows contribute to our economies and our planetary well-being. Our second global challenge is up-to-date information on the locations and global status of seagrass meadows. Global seagrass distribution and status is relatively difficult to map and monitor largely due to its widespread distribution across the world and the limited scientific resources that are directed towards seagrass. As a result, efforts to map the global distribution of seagrass have been fairly limited. There are still vast areas of our coastlines that remain unknown and uncharted from a seagrass perspective. In fact, there are 42 coastal countries that are completely deficient in any data on seagrass presence. Even in the UK, we, we don't truly have a comprehensive map of our seagrass. And new meadows and new patches are constantly being reported. So without this comprehensive understanding of where seagrass meadows are, their condition and their size, how, how can we even begin to protect them? We need this information if we are to understand how seagrass contributes to climate mitigation at the global scale, but also at the national scale so that countries can include seagrass as offsetting measures within their nationally determined contributions or NDCs. I think simply put, we'd, we'd have a better understanding of how close we are to tackling the climate emergency if we knew the distribution of our nature-based solutions. And moving on then, there's extensive evidence of globally widespread threats to seagrass that originates from both land and ocean. And seagrass degradation is, is primarily related to three broad factors, poor water, water quality, physical disturbance, and the degradation of food webs. Now, unfortunately, seagrass meadows place within the coastal seascape, the coastal landscape, means that conservation goals and human activities often collide, requiring local management action that targets both direct and indirect threats. Seagrasses are often afford, afforded kind of blanket protection under legis legislation as priority habitats. But this protection is often 
meaningless if we ignore the threats that are occurring locally, the threats that are occurring on the ground. For example, evidence from the Philippines and Kenya illustrates that creating marine protected areas, MPAs alone, is insufficient to protect seagrasses. And this is because the major threats arise from land use change. They arise from the degradation of forests and coastal development. And this is true for many threats to our coastal waters, particularly those that affect water quality, which all originate from land. In addition to this, we have comparatively less severe threats, things like anchorings and moorings or bait digging, for example. But these can happen at such high frequency that they may even be worse than the larger, more persistent threats. So there are very few places where seagrass is considered truly protected from all of these different stresses. And as a result of this, variability in stresses that we see from one site to another, no one rule works for everywhere. We need to do everything on a context site level basis. This is why we need information on the threats that exist locally. And I mean from our, you know, I mean here from our local bays to, you know, this this uh, estuary here, um, you know, how can calls for seagrass protection work if we don't know what we are protecting seagrasses from. Now, seagrass meadows are complex social ecological systems and a, a major challenge in their conservation lies in achieving a balance between the objectives of environmental, ecological and socioeconomic sustainability. So, we need to conserve seagrass meadows for the important ecological functions, such as their role in supporting biodiversity, their, their broader environmental functions, such as climate mitigation and nutrient absorption, all while ensuring that the people that utilize them for um, livelihoods and food security or recreation retain access to them. And obviously, this is hard because conflicts do exist between the needs of biodiversity conservation and the continued supply of seafood. But seagrass fisheries, for example, can be sustainable. Working with communities, seeing them as part of the ecosystem rather, uh, rather than a part of it is vital if we are to foster management that actually works. And this is, the, this is the same for UK seagrass meadows, which are often source of conflict between recreational boat users and conservationists. But implementing simple solutions, things like eco moorings and safe anchoring zones are a win-win for both parties. So the challenge here is that the sea and seagrass needs to be for everyone. And only by working together can we implement measures that truly work for everyone. And a major hurdle to overcome these first four challenges is the relatively limited effort allocated to seagrass research and conservation, particularly when you compare it to other coastal and nearshore habitats like coral reefs and seaweeds, for example. Not only is it a past and current problem, but it's rapidly getting worse. For example, from 2006 onwards, funding towards coral reef research and conservation has surpassed 1 billion US dollars, but only a little over 4 million has been invested in seagrass. And there's now a global fund for coral reefs supported by many governments, you know, including the UK, but nothing similar for seagrass, despite 
the vast benefits they provide from, for things like fisheries, uh, food security and, and climate mitigation. So even the UK government does more to protect coral reefs than it does the seagrass on its own shore. And a major cause of this is the fact that there are relatively few researchers studying seagrasses, particularly you know, in relation to their widespread near global distribution. You know, you'd think that there'd be seagrass researchers everywhere, but you know, it's only a, a handful of people in each, each of these coastal countries. And most seagrass research focuses on a few key species centered around areas of the world where monetary resources are available. Places like Australia, the US and, and uh, Europe. And this geographically concentrated seagrass research effort creates obvious challenges in generating and generalizing research outcomes, particularly for conservation. So the challenge here is inspiring current and future scientists to produce new applied seagrass science for conservation. An increase the capacity of, of current seagrass research and conservation across the world. The final challenge is conservation action in an era of climate change. Conserving seagrass meadows is, you know, it's, it's hard enough when the conditions are perfect. But we now have a, a race against time to protect what we have and restore what we have lost before it's all too late. Warming seas mean changes to seagrass distribution that affects our ability to restore in areas once lost. And this is the case particularly around the subtropics. An increased frequency of storms and severe weather events place seagrasses at risk from natural hazards, like the 2012 heat wave in Australia that I mentioned earlier. But conservation action within this era of climate change does provide hope, given how seagrasses can help in the fight against climate change. But seagrasses can only help us. They can only contribute if we invest in their protection now. So with this in mind, to secure a sustainable future for the world's seagrass ecosystems, so to, to secure a future for seagrass, we need to respond to these six global challenges with actions. Actions that go beyond these constantly evolving paper-based targets and things like blanket protection as a priority habitat to actual, to something that's measurable and impactful at both global and local scales. And with this in mind, there is ocean optimism. There is hope for the world's seagrass meadows. And at Project Seagrass, we've made it our mission to secure a future for seagrass. And these six global challenges form a blueprint, a, a guiding light, if you like, for our activities. In 2016, we created Seagrass Spotter, a global tool and citizen science program that effectively responds to three of these global challenges for seagrass conservation. Seagrass Spotter helps educate the public about seagrass meadows, where they are and what species exist within our very own coastal environments. So fostering individuals to care about seagrasses that exist locally. It was designed with the intention to help us map the global distribution of seagrass meadows, to create a, a global picture of seagrass with pictures, if you like. So individuals upload geo-reference photos 
to our global open access database reporting where seagrasses grow and what species occur. Information that's vital to help us understand carbon stocks and fisheries support. And it also helps us understand the threats that exist locally. We're now creating this global picture of seagrass meadows, fueled by 2,500 citizen scientists. We've received over 3,500 sightings of seagrass across 99 countries and territories, revealing seagrass meadows unknown to scientists and managers, even in the UK. And this is now the most widely distributed citizen science program that exists for seagrass. And it is growing, it's continuing to grow and mature and develop. And the data we've received here has helped reveal the prevalence of seagrass threats across the world, where nearly 40% of meadows are affected by things like anchorings and moorings, things that have simple solutions, providing hope for the future. And this data has also been used by scientists in predictive mapping of coastal carbon stocks, like this study from Sweden. Seagrass spotter data here helped reveal that hydrodynamically exposed seagrass meadows have greater organic carbon and nitrogen stocks than those that exist in more sheltered areas. Information that is vital for management and inclusion within emission targets. So not all seagrass meadows are the same when it comes to climate. And Seagrass Spotter has helped reveal that type of information. Now, operating under the goals of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, we're a key partner in a project um, aiming to increase the capacity of scientific research to support seagrass conservation. So responding to one of the other global challenges for seagrass conservation. And in the Indo-Pacific Ocean, information on the status of seagrass ecosystems and the services they provide is lacking, fueled by a dispro disproportionate allocation of funds for coral reefs. And this project contributes to reducing these knowledge gaps, reducing these kind of unknowns by engaging local NGOs and, and communities in the conservation of seagrass. So increasing that local capacity for good. And we're training NGOs in participatory science, things like fish surveys, household interviews, and even carbon monitoring to to enable them to collect data and identify key areas of seagrass for communities. And this information is then used to engage communities and decision makers in developing policies for seagrass conservation, for food security and climate mitigation. So this provides even more hope for the future of seagrass meadows in a changing climate. And ecosystems like seagrass support all life on Earth. The healthier our ecosystems are, the healthier the planet and its people. And the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration aims to prevent, to halt, to reverse the degradation of ecosystems like seagrass across the world. Project Seagrass is a supporting partner to this decade. So we're working to we're working on conservation actions in the era of climate change. And under this decade and under the goals of this decade, we've embarked on a series of innovative restoration programs to garden the sea. Combining scientists and communities, we're bringing biodiversity back to our oceans, we're contributing to carbon sequestration and 
a host of other benefits that seagrasses provide. All, all around us, we see, we see doom and gloom, you know, stories of polluted rivers, deforestation, forest fires and devastating hurricanes. And I think while doom and gloom is needed to alert society to the problems we face, these negative stories may only serve to fuel feelings of hopelessness. Feelings that certain problems are, are too big to be fixed or that societal contributions won't help. So instead of focusing on that, the doom and gloom, you know, this terrible situation for seagrasses with loss pretty much everywhere we look. So instead of that, our aims here are to foster hope, to inspire the restoration of 2,500 hectares of seagrass in the UK, to show that people can make change, to show that people can do good. So it's, it's just as much conservation for communities as it is communities doing conservation. So looking back then to the, to the seagrass empire created by the Cabot Company, we once harvested seagrass on huge scales to insulate our homes and buildings, a once forgotten ecosystem and forgotten resource that was vital for development across society. But we're now bringing it back. We're now bringing that resource back into our lives. Instead of harvesting seagrass leaves, we're instead harvesting its seeds. Seeds that are then used to plant hope. Working with communities across Wales, Scotland and England, we've now planted over one million of these seagrass seeds. Seeds that will go on to create thriving marine ecosystems, ecosystems that could rejuvenate cod and oyster fisheries by providing favorable habitats. Ecosystems that could clean up our waterways, providing safe and healthy spaces for, for recreation, and ecosystems that can help us in our fight against climate change by absorbing and locking away carbon in our oceans. So I see our work as kind of a, you know, an underwater exhibition of what our coasts could and should look like. And success stories in other areas of the world give us hope that this can happen. In the world's largest seagrass restoration project, scientists have observed an ecosystem from birth, like the stage we're at in the UK, all the way to full recovery. In this 20 plus year project, re researchers and, and volunteers, they spread more than 70 million seagrass seeds off the coast of Virginia in the United States. And within the first 10 years of restoration, researchers witnessed an ecosystem that was rebounding rapidly across all, almost every indicator of ecosystem health. Seagrass cover, water quality and carbon and nitrogen storage, fish and invertebrate biomass all greatly improved. And they found that meadows in place for nine or more years stored on average 130% more carbon and over 200% more nitrogen than younger areas, suggesting that as an ecosystem matures and recovers over time, storage capacity increases. And within 20 years, these restored seagrass meadows were accumulating carbon and nitrogen at rates similar to that of naturally undisturbed seagrass meadows. 
and fish and invertebrate stocks are now fully recovered with local fisheries benefiting greatly. So these restored seagrass meadows are, are now sequestering on average about 3,000 metric tons of carbon per year and more than 600 metric tons of nitrogen. Carbon and nitrogen that would otherwise contribute to global warming and pollution. So this is a perfect example of how nature-based solutions can help mitigate climate change and restore biodiversity. And it provides real long lasting hope. It provides a blueprint for future ecosystem restoration and has inspired many others like us to do the same. So seagrass restoration initiatives are now global in scope, providing real hope of reversing or halting this current declining trend for seagrass. Large projects in Australia have mobilized hundreds of citizen scientists in their restoration activities and projects in Denmark have illustrated how quickly fish and invertebrates return to areas when seagrass is restored. So these growing number of projects provide us hope for our ambitions to meet the terms set out in the Paris Agreement. So since 2013, when the IPCC first recognized the important role that seagrasses can play in global climate mitigation efforts and momentum has, has really grown to include coastal blue carbon in environmental conservation policies and plans at kind of national level. So with all of this attention focused around blue carbon and seagrasses, some countries are starting to listen. They're starting to take note of the important ally that seagrass can be. And Seychelles is one of several countries assessing the role that seagrass ecosystems can play in meeting its commitments to the, to the goals established in the Paris Agreement. So in particular, this nation has committed in its nationally determined contributions to protecting 50% of its seagrass by 2025 and 100% by 2030. This project not only will directly support the Seychelles NDC commitments, but it, it also serves as a model for other countries interested in including seagrass protections and restoration as part of a climate response policy. So the future for seagrass, you know, it, it does look bright. A hundred years ago, seagrass insulation was a lifeline that helped keep Antarctic explorers like Robert Falcon Scott warm. Here, pictured in his seagrass insulated hut. Today, though, seagrass throws us a new lifeline to help tackle climate change, support biodiversity and the people that depend on it. Our survival as a species, it really depends on how we tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. And I think seagrass is, is vital in securing this sustainable future. So today I leave you with, with one message, one demand. If anything here has inspired you, has, has given you hope, then pledge your support for Seagrass and inspire others to do the same. Across society, we really need Seagrass, but I think that Seagrass also needs us. Thank you for listening.